Welcome, everyone, to another edition of the Wrestling Underground Podcast. I am your host, Chad Porto, and joining me, as always, is Marcus Green. Marcus, I'm going to ask you first, then we'll get into it, because it's, it's, it's going to be a show. How are you? Yeah. Falling okay, man. A little bit of a sullen Monday, but we're here, and uh, we go another another show about wrestling. Yeah, and unfortunately... We have to start off with uh, news that really happened suddenly. Um, I want to say it was Friday, maybe Saturday. Uh, it was reported that Scott Hall went in for, I, I think it was a hip operation. And apparently they didn't realize or didn't know that he had a blood clot, apparently. That, that's, that was what was kind of thrown around. And it caused him to have multiple heart attacks, I guess, during surgery. And it pretty much rendered him brain dead, unfortunately. And last night, Kevin Nash kind of gave an update um, that they were going to take him off life support today as soon as his family could get there. And that's exactly what happened. It took several hours, but I think it was 839 uh, it was announced that Scott Hall had passed away. And it's one of those cases where five, six, seven years ago, you tell me Scott Hall died, I'd be like, yeah, expected. Because he was wildly out of control, did all sorts of things, just couldn't keep his head on straight. But since like 2013, 2014, the dude's been sober clean. All of his appearances were wildly well-received. I don't think he was doing a lot. I, th- I think he did, like, one or two TV appearances for WWE. But, like, every, t- every convention, like, he was sober, cognitive, engaging. And he, you know, really regained his reputation. So, to sit here today and have to talk about his passing, it's like... I mean, I granted, yeah, you know, the Reaper comes for us all eventually, but... This was supposed to be like some hip cleaning surgery or like a hip replacement thing or something like that. It wasn't supposed to be life-threatening. So to be in the situation and, and have to talk about his extremely sudden, extremely unexpected passing is, is heartbreaking. Uh, I was never a huge Scott Hall fan, but I, I acknowledge and recognize his impact on the industry. I mean, how can you not look at the NWO? Look at what he did as a worker in the WWE. He was arguably the archetype for the modern pro wrestler. You know, I don't want to say with no Scott Hall, there'd be no Brian Cage or, or, you know, um, Keith Lee or Jonah or whoever, but he was a six foot eight, near 300 pound athlete. So he really set the kind of the standard for what big men can do in wrestling, you know, and it was kind of a trip to watch him perform because you never knew. It's, well, at least when I got into it, because when I was like really getting into wrestling, it was like 97, 98, 99. But I had watched, you know, sporadically throughout the years, you know, ever since I was like three and I saw Sting at the Great American Bash. But <clears throat> with Hall, it was always, which version are you getting? And there are times when he was properly motivated and he looked fantastic. And then there's times when he was just going through the motions. And it was a shame that we could never see the fully motivated Hall because that Hall would have been fantastic to watch consistently. Marcus, any favorite moments from Scott Hall stand out to you that you want to ruminate? I mean, obviously, you know, you look back and, and, and just, uh, you know, I like was we talking about before the show, um, I kind of missed out on the whole uh you know, Razor, Razor Ramon, WCW's uh, Scott Hall, glory days of it all. But, you know, going back and watching stuff, I mean, obviously he was a very unique character of his time, like you say. Um, very definition of somebody that stood out in the industry, made their mark. Obviously the legendary match he had with Shawn Michaels. That old stick is, is, is you know, legendary run with, with the NWO and everything that that did for and, and in the industry and um yeah like like you i wasn't necessarily a big fan but can't ignore um 
and have nothing but respect for his contribution to the industry. But uh, yeah, it's just you know it's just sad. Um, but but you know as somebody who kind of just watched from a distance, um, it, it was so cool, like you said, to to see him get uh, better. Because one of the saddest things I've seen ever in relation to wrestling wrestling was years ago when his E60 came out about him. Yeah. He was truly one of the saddest things. I wouldn't I, I hadn't watched anything in terms of matches or what I knew about Scott Hall obviously, but I really wasn't a big fan of uh, caught up in any of his work like talking about it, but I, when I watched that it was just like like wow, like this is like like it it hit me like it hit me like I knew him and it was just sad and if you like like you said if you would have told me you know not too long after that uh some years back some years away from that that he had passed it would have been 100 percent believable because everything you saw on that i mean you look at that and that was he was looking the reaper in the eye on that thing mm -hmm. and for him to, i think officer linked up with you know god god bless him diamond dallas page um who was, you know, really truly been a godsend to a lot of his friends in the industry. You know, he linked up with him, and I think, you know, he helped him as, as well as some stuff I'm sure he did on his own. You know, it was really cool to see Scott be one of the guys that really got his stuff together and, and was able to, to, to deal with some of his demons head on and, and get to a place where he was. I like I think the best I saw him look was at his Hall of Fame speech. Mm -hmm. You know, WWE, that was great in that line, you know, um, Bad times don't last with bad guys doing that whole deal. It was just really cool to see. So, like you said, man, it's really sad, but a, another legend who, you know, left an indelible, indelible mark on the industry that, that won't be forgotten, you know. So, Kevin Nash posted an Instagram post last night and pretty much said, you know, Scott was never a perfect guy, but as Scott would always say, uh, the last man who was ever perfect on this earth got nailed to a cross. And that's the title of today's show, so... I thought, you know, that's a pretty poignant quote. Yeah. So that's our, our show title today. Uh, I just want to kind of touch on this. Uh, kind of one of the things that's getting overlooked as people are talking about Scott's contributions. He was arguably the biggest name in, in Impact history when, when the company debuted. The three stars, the three pillars, if you want to go with that antiquated kind of AEW always steals everyone else's references reference was, you know, Ken Shamrock, Jeff Jarrett, and Scott Hall. And arguably the biggest name of the three of them was Scott Hall. Maybe Shamrock, <clears throat> only because of his cross-promotion appeal, but, you know, they were really kind of leaning on Hall. Um, obviously, in 2002, he still hadn't had his, his act together, so it ended up not paying off. He came in three different times after that, so four times total. He came back, I think, in late 2002, early 2003. Then he came back in late 2004 and stayed till early 2005. Even had a match with AJ Styles. Um, <clears throat> then he came back, of course, in 2007. I'm sorry, he had five stunts. Because 2007 was his fourth appearance. And he and Kevin Nash and Samoa Joe were supposed to have that triple threat against Tyson, Tom, Co., Christian Cage, and Kurt Angle. But he no-showed, which led to Samoa Joe's, um, what are you going to do, fire me speech? And then we had 2010, when he came back once again, this time with Sean Waltman, to reform the NWO with Kevin Nash as the band. And honestly, with the exception of 2007, I liked all of his runs in TNA. 2007 was just very short, but it also had a lot of great moments because that was the Scott Hall return during the buildup of Booker T's debut. And that was like, that was like one of the head games. With things like, you know, uh, Kevin Nash and Kurt Angle. You're, you're not going to believe who I'm bringing with me to, to Genesis, Chico. And everyone's like, oh, they're bringing back Scott Hall. And then Scott Hall shows up and he's like, listen, I'm not Sting's tag team partner. And then Booker T shows up at Genesis. I'm like, oh, this is great. I love this storytelling. But, of course, fans shat on it because it was 2007. And if you weren't trying to be different than the WWE, you were failing. And it's like, ugh, I hate you. I hate all of you. <laughs> Because you look at AEW now, if they were doing the same stuff in 2011, 20, 2007 that they were doing now, I, I would have to hazard a guess that the internet would hate them. 
But if Impact did all that stuff that they were doing 2007, 2010, today, oh, Impact would be the, 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 the new hotness. So it just goes to show you that you're not appreciated in your time. That's what I keep telling myself whenever I get, whenever I get dumped. <laughs> huh. They'll appreciate me later. I was I was beyond you. I was I was years ahead of you, my child. You, you she was streets behind. I was streets ahead. Yeah, it's uh, it's always interesting that narrative, and that that maybe that's another conversation we have for a different day. Like listing off all the quote unquote guys that they brought in that they shouldn't have been using according to other people, and, and like who got used the best. Like I always think of names like probably one of the most guys that they used the most effectiveness and maybe well past his effectivity, if you will, was Kurt Angle. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, you look at other guys like, uh, you know, obviously Christian Cage and, 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 you know, the list goes on, but not every quote unquote WWE ball that they brought in, they, fu- they, they didn't fumble all those balls, you know, but uh, again, it, you know, it's a narrative a lot of times when it comes to wrestling fans with how they feel about TNA because they just want they refuse to let them let that old stink off of them because it's you know it's fun having somebody to pick on. Yeah, yeah, and that's the internet for you. During that time, that 2010 especially, there were definitely some guys that had no business being there. I just felt like Scott Hall and Sean Waltman, especially Sean Sean Waltman, because he was really good at that point. Uh, I, I feel like those guys, your Sean Morley's, your Nasty Boys, your Bubba the Love Sponges, those yeah. guys hurt every other new edition. So, that's my I didn't, even, I didn't even know they brought in the Love Sponge, but just in the fact that you mentioned that again, <laughs> that's definitely a fumble ball category. Yeah, uh, Awesome Kong knocked him out. Oh, bless her. That's why she got fired. <laughs> oh, wow, that's... She uh, she assaulted him in front of Spike TV executives. So, like, I get why they fired her. Like, I do. I think it was a justified firing, but also... <laughs> what did he do to bring that on? <laughs> uh, it was right after the earthquake in Haiti. And I don't know what Bubba said because I don't listen to his show. But apparently Awesome Kong took um, umbrage with it. And attacked him. Sound like he must have coordinated himself. Yeah, and considering <laughs> that Bubba the Lost Sponge is the type of guy who will record his best friend having sex with his wife, even if he didn't say anything overtly racist, I, 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 I'm sure he did something to deserve it. Granted, you never really deserve that kind of reaction, but like, there are people where I'm like, okay. That was garbage. You need to be in jail. And then there are times where I'm like, okay, you need to stand in the corner for 15 minutes. Think about what you did. <laughs> yeah, now, nah, nah, if he would have did something to her, like inappropriate to touch, you can't really dictate that response. No, no, no. At that, at that point, you know, my, yeah. my whole thought was words don't elicit violence. Yeah. But touching elicits violence. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm yeah, very but... much the, if you touch me and I didn't give you permission, I'm, I'm going to touch you back. <laughs> Unless it's one of them situations where he's trying to miss the T. Hey, woman. Hey, woman. <laughs> <laughs> like, if, if, if he says something about your mom or your, or your or close family member, like Chad, has, you know, your, your niece and nephew or something, and, and he's trying to say something to him and they right there with you, you got to at that point. You just <laughs> it depends because the one thing I've always realized, because I've been um, watching kids for a while. Cause like I'm, I'm always the, the uncle they call. I was always the cousin they called for watch kids. They react to the violence almost probably even more so than the word. So if they say something that's dumb, just it's best just to walk away. Cause otherwise you're going to be making it worse for the kids. Mm. Now, if they start getting like, you know, sh- she's nine and he's making all sorts of gross statements or making threats, <clears throat> that's a different situation, especially if yeah. it's threats. Because at that point, yeah, yeah, at that point, if it's a threat, you, you just, you, you flat out say, like, he threatened her. Like, I don't know if he's being serious or not. It's why it's illegal to threaten someone. <laughs> so, like, in that case, yeah, like, punch him in the throat. 
But if he just calls her a bitch, it's like, bro, you just called like a nine year old a bitch. Like, there's only one here, and it was you. Like, Uncle, Uncle Chad, yeah. What's a Cleveland steamer? What? <laughs> that that would not be a conversation I have with a nine year old. That's one of those where I go ask her mother, <laughs> and then I go out for coffee. It, no, no, where did for five that? hours. Who said that to you? Him? Okay. All right. Oh, uh, uh, uh. uh, yeah. That's that's a conversation I don't want to have. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, there's still more bad news. So Friday, probably like a couple hours before Scott Hall's whole whole blood clot issue happened. We found out that Big E broke his neck. And he broke two vertebrates, I think is, is, is what it said. I think it was like his L2 and his L5 or something like that. <clears throat> Good news, he doesn't need surgery. <clears throat> There's no damage to the sp- uh, spinal cord or any nerve damage or anything of the sort. The bad news is, because of the way these broke, there are concerns because it was a compression injury. There, there are concerns that when it heals, it may not heal correctly. This is according to one former WWE and NFL doctor who wrote an article about it. And he pretty much said, you know, because it was a compression break, there is legitimate concern that, you know, if it doesn't heal correctly, and, and there's a chance that it may not, that he won't be able to wrestle like, ever again. And... I, 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 on one hand, it's like, this is some really riveting, interesting piece of information, and I appreciate that, because I like learning things. On the other hand, if some doctor who's not my doctor is saying shit about my health, the minute I can get out of that bed, I'm taking a sledgehammer to his foot. Like, I, I, you are not my doctor. Do not be trying to diagnose me over the internet off of Wrestling Inc.'s website. I don't need Mark Middleton's terrible ass reporting being the basis of your thesis on my neck oh dear god not wrestling ink never wrestling ink raj giri's a twat like i can accept that like uh sean ross sap is is like a guy people trust that's fine i think he's a tool but like i respect his toolness right like he and i would never be friends if we were in the same room i would throw pudding at him <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me where very, I'm getting it. You don't need to know. That was very specific. Like, I'm keeping these drumettes, but this pudding? <laughs> <laughs> I got cake, hot dogs, pizza. Pudding's going in your face, though. <clears throat> but, like, fair, right? Like, all right, Sean Ross has some, has some clout, and, and, and it's earned. But guys like Raj Giri, ugh. Very, very, very just, ugh. So, anyway... I don't like that this doctor's trying to diagnose Big E over the internet. But on the other hand, <clears throat> he's seen this type of injury before and he knows what can come with it. So I, I get him informing people in his blog post or, or article. I don't know if it was for a health journal or what. Now, when it all happened, my first thought is because I've been saying it for a decade. Big E goes through the middle ropes and he always like lands on his head. I'm like, he's going to break his fucking neck one day. Marcus, I don't know how many times I've told you this on this very show or on one of the incarnations of this show that we do. Like, Big E's going to break his neck if he keeps doing that. We've referenced it several times. As good as it looks, even when, it, even when it's perfectly executed, it still looks bad. It's one of those moves. Um, because we, and we, we've talked about this, too. The other, the other part of certain moves in wrestling, I don't know if the, the wrist justifies the, the hit. Like... That coffin drop that Darby does, right? Mm-hmm. Could essentially just given over the fate at that point. But yeah, I did. You know, when I first heard it, because I didn't see it when it happened uh, live. So when I saw stuff about his neck, I immediately went to it was that damn rope dive. It's that damn rope dive because mm-hmm. it's it, again, you just jumping out there, you trying to split a guy through the ropes. The guy's not catching you because he got to worry about falling on the floor. So it's like. And then we saw what happened. It was a bad suplex landing. And I'm like, I was sitting there like, I, I, I almost wish it was the damn dive because that looked 
just really bad. Yeah, so Ridge Holland tried to suplex him, do a, do an overhead belly to belly. Yeah. Now I don't know if Biggie mistimed the move because with a belly to belly, you, you got to kind of pounce, like like you got you got to Monty Brown yourself over. <laughs> and for whatever reason, that's not what happened. And uh, on on the rotation, Biggie ended up getting kind of caught, I guess, and he landed right on his head. And he was done. Like, like once you saw, like he he went, he went mm-hmm. limp. So it yeah. was like, nearly instantaneous. But on one hand, it's like you know I don't want to come down too hard, hard on, on. I keep wanting to call him Madcap because they have all terrible names on Ridge Holland because it takes two to tango in that move. On the other hand, it's also like if you didn't think you could get him over, why would you even try? Like you can. St- and, like, the thing that really pisses me off is, like, those high-angle suplex, like, around the chest or, like, the, uh, the clutch suplex, like, where, where Taz would hook the guy's arm and, and bring his arm around his neck and then bring him over. I, 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 I forgot what it was called. Like, the cobraplex, I think. It's more like an exploder? Kind of, but it was more like, um, it was more like an, an inverted Taz mission, and he would bring him up over his head, but he would rotate and then bring him down on his back. I had to uh, find it. Yeah, I think that's on that. that, that I, feel, I feel like that's on a uh, day of reckoning too. I got, but uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, but like, if you don't think you can get a guy over like that, go for the leg. You know, do do a, a clutch suplex where, where you hook the leg and you bring your arm around the back of his neck, and then you hook your arm through it and then bring him oh, over because you're you're carrying less weight on, on the lower. Oh, end. at least yo, at least do it better to side because Big E might not be the tallest dude, but he's that man is. All muscle. Mm-hmm. He's all muscle, and then we know we know that carries more mass than fat. So, and, and Holland ain't no small boy uh, at all. But again, it's it's just one of them things. I'm pretty sure he feels like that's a movie. It's always a movie we've executed a bunch of times. Um, I think I was looking, at, and, and maybe he's done something else to someone. And then this is like you said, not necessarily to come down on Holland because you none of these guys want to go out there and f each other up. That's right. not the goal. And accidents happen. Like, like you could be the yeah. best worker in the world. Like, Sting ended uh, Rick Rude's uh, career. Yeah. You know? Um, D'Lo Brown paralyzed Roz. Uh, yeah. AJ Styles broke uh, Lionheart's neck. Yeah. We, Granted, we that was more Rick. on him. Because yeah, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at him, Russell KO, right now in the main event. Rollins had no intentions on Nobody wants to do what happened with, what happened with Sting. But, um... Yeah, it's just one of them things, man. Like real freak accident, obviously, and also immediately now this um, came across your mind when you saw the, the footage. I immediately thought back to um, what's his name from Impact when dude came down on his mm, head and Jesse the Sorensen. Yeah. Yes, uh, I I didn't think about that until right now, but yeah, that was a scary ass visual because Sorensen also broke his neck via compression. But he also mm-hmm. lost sensation in his extremities at that time too. I don't know yeah. if that was an issue for Big E in the in the immediacy, because I think he also suffered a concussion. I think because he was unconscious for mm-hmm. for a few. So, very yeah. scary situation. Very glad to know yeah. he's okay. Hopefully, the injury is not career ending. You know, he's one of those guys that everyone likes and for good reason. So it, it would be a. a a damn shame if he had to retire, especially on the same weekend that you know we lost Scott Hall. Like we yeah. as wrestling fans have suffered uh, enough. Yeah, and it, it's it's really I mean like the only real silver lining, like you said, when he got on the uh, Twitter and well, two silver lines really is the feedback you saw. Like it's nobody in the industry that 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 dislikes this guy. Also, uh, he really is one of the one, one well, of you know the, the good the good one. <sighs> Shout out to Sheik. <laughs> the longest going narrative. I love how he won't let it die. It's like a month. Month of reminder, people. Fuck all go. Uh, the the best religion. Um, right? The best religion. Uh, shout out to Sheik. You live on forever. But um, like I said, silver lining is the fact that he could move his extremities. Like you said, nothing requires surgery because that's always a, a, a thing. Um and in fact, like I said, that the other thing that people just love him across the across 
the entire industry, people just love the guy. So, um, and then ultimately, even with all these different companies and, and situations that's going on, people are just one big family. Everybody's in the same thing, trying to get to a lot of the same goals, trying to just eat and put food on the table for, because for most people, this is all they've ever known. So, mm -hmm. um, it was cool. It's always cool to see the industry come together for good people like that because we, <laughs> We've had a couple of years of just weeding out so many of the trash ones that we thought were good. So to see that type of feedback from an actually good human both on and off screen is uh is cool. But like you said, we've suffered enough. Um I guess Cause that would have sucked. Um But yeah, hopefully like you said, he's uh he can bounce back from this, and when he come back, it'll be huge. So, that's the hope. That's the hope. Speaking of hope, Jeff Hardy has it because he's 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 back in wrestling with AEW. I would say the worst of all of Jeff Hardy's returns historically. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so weird. <laughs> so. Matt's getting beat up. Sting and Darby Allen come down. <laughs> Things are not going the hero's way. And then Jeff Hardy comes out as Matt's getting his butt kicked. And then he, <laughs> like, he, he stops for a second and does the hand thing. I'm like, okay. But then he starts uh, going down the ramp doing the hand thing. And I'm like, <laughs> what? Uh, and then he gets in the ring. And I'm like, oh, no, don't no, do, do it again. <laughs> it it literally like if Leonardo's getting his ass kicked by the foot. I don't know. Well, you know, numbers. It did. Then Rav, Donna, Donnie, and and Mikey pop up out of the sewers, but they start posing. <laughs> like get stomped out. Like what are you doing? Like it, it. It looked so bad. It's like, dude. First off, this really wasn't a surprise. It got spoiled in an interview weeks ago. Mm hmm. Like this, this wasn't a surprise. He, it was, it was, it was, it, was, it, it made the segment look stupid. Um, besides the, the fact that, um, anytime El Idolo gets on the mic, I'm like, oh God, this is why you need a Selena, because <laughs> his his English is is so far from perfect. He's not a good promo, like at all. Nice suits, but that's. Uh, Oh yeah, he he he's a dapper yeah. dapper man, cannot speak. Yeah. So Jeff Hardy comes out to the Hardy Boys thing. Yeah, and that was fantastic. Now a lot of people are like, "Whoa, well, how they do that?" But if you've been watching anything for the last twenty years, you know that that's generic theme music. It's not WB owned. <laughs> I don't know if it was at one point and they let the copyright go, but I remember watching like the History Network, I think, or A and E, and they were doing mm -hmm. like some type of like documentary. It may have been the Hulk Hogan one from 2010. It may have been like a comic book one or something, but it played. I'm like, they're playing the Hardy Boys theme. <laughs> yeah, it's ba it's basically a universally catchy instrumental. Yeah, and, and I thought that was great. I loved it. So like, yeah, I wasn't <laughs> surprised at all. When he came out to it, I'm like, oh, okay, so this is this yeah. is this is the thing now. Now I would imagine WWE's rights just expired on the uh, whole thing about with cult the personality, right? Well, they they leased that, um, gotcha. because that's owned by um, in Living Color. Thank you. Yeah, by Living Color. Yeah. So when CM Punk yeah. left, they didn't really have any reason to to keep the lease around. So. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of those AEW songs aren't owned by AEW. Like, Jungle Boy's theme isn't owned by AEW. Um, who else? Uh, um, I would imagine, I would imagine, um, not Ambrose. You know who I mean. No, Ambrose. Um, uh, Wild Thing, that's not owned by AEW. Because that's, no, that, that's, that yeah, that's from, yeah, that's from Major League. Uh, uh, well, not from Major League, but that's where it became very popular yeah. was Major League the movie. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Like, and him, he is not owned. Uh, like you said, Jungle Boys and it was not owned. Darby Allens is not uh, owned. Uh, Orange gotcha. Cassidy is, isn't owned. I would have to imagine Jericho's isn't owned. Because if Jericho ever leaves, I'm sure he wants to retain the rights to his song. 
Yeah, but I'm about to say, I mean, he's owned by Jericho. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. All these songs are owned by somebody, just not owned by AEW. They're, they're leased and licensed. Technically, they're, they're referred to as a licensed song because they, they yeah. sent a contract saying, like, we'll use this song for this performer for three years, and then we'll retain any, you know, audio or not audio, but any visual um, quality uh, type of uh, um, playbacks for 15 years in perpetuity. Yeah. And then, you know, we'll have to, you know, relinquish all rights. So basically what that means is Jeff Hardy's, uh, no, we'll go with CM Punk. CM Punk's using called personality. Let's say he's on a three-year deal. Let's say he retires at 45. His contract, the contract they signed with called personality may allow AEW to use that song for 15, 20 odd years after CM Punk leaves. But that song will eventually have to get to a point where they either renew it with the band or they have to start dubbing over songs. So, like, when you watch New Japan or you watch old WWE on the network or the Peacock network, I should say, and you watch a song and, and it's no longer that song, it's some generic whatever, the license for that song finally ran out. That's why they change it. And that was never an issue with DVD. Because, like, once it was on the DVD, like, they, they paid the, the band and, and whomever percentage of that DVD. So, like, if you have Cult of Personality on a bunch of DVDs from, like, early 2000 to 2005, you might be paying them 20 cents every time a DVD sells, or 15 cents, or 5 cents, or something like that. So, now that that's no longer a thing, you know, you're, you're looking more at length of, of, of use instead of just percentages of pay per use. So, it's a very, it's a very interesting kind of situation. And that's why... Yeah. Brian Danielson didn't come out to his old Ring of Honor theme, which was Final Countdown by Europe, because they didn't want to negotiate a fair price and were super exorbitant on, on, on the demand. So the, yeah. uh, Tony Khan just said, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, the concept of fair is oftentimes subjective in business. Yep. Um, so do we think but, that uh, Jeff Hardy's going to have a, a good run? I mean, if it, it can't it can't be completely trash with his brother. And look, they looked the apart, but we know what their bodies are. <laughs> oh, we, we can safely assume what they are. It's the, it's the Dark Knight Rises. Um, it's it's cool to see them back in there, their '90s garb and whatever. And the fact that they can still pull that look off mm -hmm. speaks to speaks to you know aging well um, as best as you can with you know with the career that they the careers that they've had. Uh, so like I said, they look great. It's cool that they get they get back in a certain form of shape to just look like um, older versions of, of their old selves, or where they could they, they like I said the same clothes. You could damn to do the same photo shoots and whatnot. But it's it comes down now to performance, and I think the great thing is they can rely on each other now to to do all that they can and still make it look good. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, you know, it's about working smarter, not harder for them at this point. And I think they're in the right position. If, if nothing else, you know, EW got a strong tag uh, division. I think they're going to put on some good stuff. Um, so, you know, as long as somebody like Jeff is, is, is in good spirits and, and stuff like that, because we, we clearly saw what he did when he wasn't in good spirits with WWE. Freaking Gail Kim did, um, which is hilarious. But, uh. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, man. I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to seeing what they do uh, with this with this potentially final run. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm optimistic, but we'll you know we'll see. Speaking of see, let's talk about Roxy. She was the last real Ring of Honor Women's Champion. I think that's fair to say. Mm hmm. Because she won the belt, then the the company base like, oh yeah, we're 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 pretty much done. And then, you know, who, who was it? Deanna Parrazzo won it from, did she beat Roxy for it? Yeah, she did. Yeah, that was right. the champ, champ challenge. Yeah. So now Roxy apparently is signing with, the, with NXT. And all I have to say is, you, uh, you dumb girl? Are you not paying attention to how all these individuals are being poorly used and then fired? What are you doing? Do you do you think that uh that tournament brought uh has something to do with it? Because they're in the middle of that. We're well, not in the middle of nearing the end of that uh women's dusty cup right now. 
No, no, I don't think that's what it was. You know, I, they probably wanted her because she's talented and young. I think she's only like twenty one. So I would I would imagine that that was more or less why they went after her. She had some talent. She was young. She's attractive. She checked all the boxes. So I, I think that was more than likely why they went after her. Why she signed is a completely different question and a completely different answer. I don't know why she signed. Yeah. You know, I, I, th- I think it's a bad career move. But yeah, they don't pay me to give them advice. But if they did, they'd be all much happier. Are you excited to see... Uh, Miss Roxy in NXT. Do you even watch NXT? That's the better question. Yeah, I've been. It's it's been. It's been more watchable for me as of late. I, I think because I, I kind of sat down like, look, I'm not gonna like everything on this roster, but what I do like, I can focus on that. So you call Melo Hayes, your Eli Drakes, um, Braun Breaker's not bad. Siampa's there. He's a stalwart. I'm not a I'm not a fan, but he, you know, he works in the context of what he works in. Um, obviously, a boss to Sam Shaw from his uh, Impact days. Um, there's a few other names on there. They got a lot of good young talent down there. It's just getting them a character that's actually captivating enough to keep the whole people, because uh, it comes off like a lot of guys are kind of blending together. But. Um, I, and you probably saw this. <laughs> Dolph just got the bill. So that's interesting. Ah, <sighs> Marcus. <laughs> I jumped off the bandwagon for you all these years. I've been off the bandwagon and rightfully so. I'm like, ah, oh, look at them. I'm going to send them to NXT and I'll let them get a title. Look at that. So. Uh, With his 1980s <laughs> perm hair. That dude's going to be bald by 50. <laughs> Oh, he, he treats his hair so poorly. Like it's not good hair. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 funny. Like I said, that that classic D Z is like the twenty thirteen, twenty fourteen and you know, prior to that, that's prime D Z. I feel like once it got to the point where we kinda of realized and he's real settled into what his narrative is in that company, his look has been indicative of, of how they see him. <laughs> He's just got. He just. He just one hundred percent bought it. Uh, just de- delved head first into it. So that is what it is. But that is an interesting shakeup going into stand and deliver, and then WrestleMania, which is you know WrestleMania weekend for them. So we'll see. We'll see. Maybe maybe it's like Charlotte, and ultimately it won't benefit the roster at all. Maybe it will. You know, because Rude. That's the closest Rude's been in that title since he was in NXT. Ah. So. <laughs> oh. Why does that man still have a job? Why does that man still want a job there? Oh. Like, that company has ruined so many people. Oh, uh, it's not even funny. Um, so, apparently, Braun Breaker might win the belt back at Stand and Deliver, which is a terrible name for a pay-per-view. Sorry. It's a premium live event. Although, it's a great movie. You ever see that? the movie Stand and Deliver? No, who's the star? Uh, Edward James Almost, I think. Okay. Let's see. Stand and deliver. Film. Yes, Edward James Almost, Lou Diamond Phillips. It's Andy Garcia. It's it's. So I watched this like four or five times in the school, because like every time the math t- t- uh, teacher was out and the substitute came in, they would play the only good math movie ever made, Stand and Deliver. <laughs> So, Edward James almost plays James uh, Jaime Escaleras, I think is his name, who was a math teacher in South Central at a mostly uh, Latino and Latina school. And he was assigned the problem child math class. The delinquents, you know, the people with learning disabilities, the people who don't speak English very well, and kind of the more the outcasts. And he ends up teaching them all sorts of different math getting to the point where they were, he was trying to teach them calculus with the idea that they could get college credit by taking this specific test. And, and the whole movie builds up to them passing the test and taking the test and then being accused of cheating on the test because they're poor uh, uh, Hispanic kids from the barrio. So, like, obviously they cheated. But Edward James almost is like, no, they didn't fucking cheat. Like, what are you doing? But it's, it's got some of the funniest moments in movie history. 
One of them is he's trying to get all the kids to show up on time. So he's like adamant. Like, if you miss one class, if you're not here on time, I'm not teaching you. And Lou Diamond Phillips plays like this gang member who's like really dead set on making his, I think it was his grandmother or maybe his mother, making her proud. So like he's going to buckle down. Like this, this dude's going to show up. And so like Edward James almost is doing the, the class. Lou Diamond Phillips isn't there. And like he's teaching and the kids are getting, you know, frustrated. And he's getting frustrated and everyone leaves. And the bell, the bell sounds and everything. And he's just standing there. And then Lou Diamond Phillips walks in and goes, Hey, I'm early. Are you proud of me? Because <laughs> he forgot what time the class was. And then uh, he, he looks at the board and it says calculus. Because <laughs> he start, she's starting to teach him calculus. And then he goes, Hey, what's calculus? <laughs> and like the whole scene just oh, it plays out so well. Lou Diamond Phillips is amazing. Oh, I love this movie. It's so dumb, but so good. Especially when he starts teaching them uh, how, how to do... Uh, what was it? A re- a geometry, I think, it was, or arithmetic. It was. It's really well done. It really is. And and it was the movie that made me think Edward James almost really should get a lot more roles. And in fact, he's the reason I watched the Battlestar Galactica reboot in 2004 because I knew that Edward James almost was going to be the new uh, uh, Admiral Adama. I'm like, all right, I'll check this out. I like it, Edward James almost, and it's fantastic. It's a great movie. Uh, it's everywhere, <laughs> like. It's from 1989, so like you can find it on just about anything. Yeah, that's just, listen. You talk about that. I'm like, you know what? This is what this is what we had for our generation uh, coming up in, in school for uh, in the place of because I feel like us and whenever we had subs off of those listening, we either had like a couple movies or just the one that the sub would always play. Mm-hmm. If they came in and didn't legitimately try to be a, a, a like a good, I guess a good sub, a, a what would be considered by the schools a good sub. We had that one movie that I think for one of my classes it was you got served. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm sitting there like, what did this concept evolve into? This evolved into the freaky deaky teachers that were actually hot. <laughs> Cause they don't, they don't have that. Like that's not what, that's not what subs do now. They don't, they don't come in and play the same thing on the big fat VHS. They got the straps on the TV to hold it down on the, on the, on the rack. Oh, that's right. But uh, yeah, good times, good times. So I, I would recommend checking that out because it, it's, it's definitely one of those movies. It's, it's real good. Um, let's see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you a clip. My friend is picking her brackets for uh, March Madness, and uh, she's doing a lot a of DraftKings. What's that? Be a lot of DraftKings this month, huh? Really? Are, are you going to do a DraftKing? Oh no, I don't do that. Uh, that's that's not my that's not my calling. But uh, <laughs> but I, I would imagine knowing that because March Madness is the colleges, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it might not be DraftKings. I think that that might have to do with the pro, but, uh, yeah. I, th- I think, they, I think DraftKings will probably do it now just because gambling is so prevalent and, and, and everywhere. So, but, uh, so she's doing like a real one, like where she tries to figure out like who is going to win realistically. And then she's doing one based off of who's going to win between the mascots, like which mascot would beat who. <laughs> so she sends me like, like who would win a Wolverine or a person. And I sent her a gif of Wolverine from the animated series of, of, of the X-Men. I'm like, yes, <laughs> the small Wolverine would win. And then she's like, wrong kind. So I sent her a, 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 a gif of, of Wolverine punching Cyclops. <laughs> because, no, there's no such thing as the wrong kind of Wolverine. Like, what are you doing? Uh, also, I sent you the, uh, the clip that I was talking about. What's called Gulas? Uh, it's such a great movie. I love, I love Stan and Deliver. It's so good. Oh, uh, it's it's so good. All right. Um, let's see. What, what what else is on the docket? Let's see. Well, I guess speaking of AEW, what happened? Did something happen? The the Conte. Oh no, we're, we're gonna get to Conte later. Gotcha. That that's on the list. For, next up is Pete Dunn got called up in the most underwhelming. Call I can ever think of, and they gave him a new name. What is it, Buddy? 
Budge? Bridge? Butch. Butch. That's what it was. Ugh. Bridge would have been better. <laughs> it would have been better. I don't know why they why they want to do this. Like, all right, I get it. You want to turn him into like some caricature or or something or other, <clears throat> but you couldn't have come up with a better name than Butch. Like, who's naming these fuckers? You have uh, Ridge Holland. You have uh, Madcap Moss. Now you have Butch. Oh, these are the darkest days. This is the darkest timeline. I cannot believe that this is reality for this company. We went from having badass Billy Gunn, the road dog Jesse James, the Undertaker, Kane, Stone Cold Steve Austin, to Butch, to, to Mad Cat Moss. Ugh. Marcus, I don't think we can recover from this. I, I think Pete Dunn's career is over. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not Gunther, but uh, it, it ain't. It's not. It's it's like cross the street from it. Um, I don't, I don't know, man. I think it's on par. Like it's not worse than Gunther. Yeah. But to be fair, I, and I want to be very clear, Walter's a dumb name too. Like he he he's so well liked that people ignore it. But what? Oh, yeah, it's my accountant, Walter. <laughs> if you're like, yeah. Who, who who's facing who? Well, we have you know the the one winged angel Kenny Omega taking on Walter. If you've never seen wrestling before, you're like ah, nah, I'm good. <laughs> Sounds kind of like a really bad matchup. Yeah, but but I feel I feel like he made it work because he's he damn near like a UK kaiju. Yeah, oh, I mean he, that's that's kind of what I'm saying. Like people don't point out how dumb of a name it is because of how. Incredible yeah. he is. Yeah. But in a it vacuum, a- Walter's a dumb fucking name. <laughs> and I don't just mean in wrestling. <laughs> Marcus, if you met a dude named Walter, as even keeled and kind as you are, you would pull out his, his pocket protector and drop it on the ground and be like, Walter. It almost reminds me of an offshoot. Well, you, 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 I would imagine, I don't think you're in one. Um, you never told me you were in one, but I, uh, it kind of reminds me like watching stuff like Drumline with the fraternities, and you, you, you know, they have you say Big Brother, but it was an, an embarrassing name behind it, like Big Brother smashed my girl, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like it's the stupidest name, but you, it's it's the it's the authority mm-hmm. that 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 sort of thing, or, or like in the hood, where like the drug dealer would have a dumb name, but it's like like Scoochie, like yeah. They, I like guess it's, it's like your name. Your your name's Nathaniel. You ain't no damn thug, but like no. He, he, All right, he, no, he, no. He, if if I met a gangster whose name was Nathaniel, I know how that dude's gonna look. He's gonna have some layers on, right? Fancy, fancy. Depending on the region, depending on 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 the you know economic region, it's gonna be a little bit different. But like he could either look kind of like uh, uh, what was that one movie? Oh, I can't. And I can't even describe it either because it's like it was about a black guy who was like a hitman kind of guy, and he had really good hair. Like that's my that's the best way I could describe this movie. Even as isolated as it is, it's still too vague. Uh, that's uh, what I'm saying. Like it's a I, I, I can't describe it anymore. That was the plot of the movie. With, with slick back hair, I can't. Like I just felt like they tried to spoof one of Seagal's '90 movies. Oh, <laughs> that'd be a great name for a movie though. Slick back hair. Sick back air. Uh, or we could bring bring up the classic example of a perceived hood guy with, with a like a, I guess a, a uppity name. And Clarence plans to have a real good marriage. <laughs> Shout out to Eight Mile Anthony Mackie. Uh, okay, okay. So I just googled black lead action films, and I found the dude. It's on a Yard Barker article. 20 best black action films ever made. So I'm, I'm about to find out this movie real fast. Uh, I've never seen Cotton Comes to Harlem. I've seen Shaft. I haven't seen Hammer. I've seen Slaughter. I haven't seen Black Caesar. Cleopatra Jones, I've seen that. Are you looking at movie before? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the 70s, so like... Is, it is Hammer, there a difference? Slaughter, Black Caesar. <laughs> I'm like, Foxy all this Brown. is missing. Is 
All this, all these titles are missing their numbers. <laughs> right? Now, Three of the Hardaway is a good film. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Truck Turner. Yeah, that's a porno. <laughs> <laughs> Beverly Hills Cl- uh, Cop. The Last Dragon. Leroy. Shaft. <laughs> Shaft Strikes Back. <laughs> Pretty much. Blade 2 on this list. Hell yeah. yeah. Blade 2 great. Uh, Bad Boys. All right, no, I'm sorry. Bad Boys 2 sucked. I did not like Bad Boys 2 at all. Am I alone on that one? And, no, I get it. I get it. I like the highway chase, but yeah, I, I get it. It's uh, like it had a great scene with uh, w- w- when the son comes to pick up the daughter. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And the fact that they picked that up into the third one, yeah, that's that's probably the best scene in that movie. <laughs> I've not seen the third one yet, so I guess I'm gonna have to. Did they bring back the same kid? Ah, oh, that's ah oh, continuity. I love it. Yeah. All right. So unfortunately, the uh, the article didn't have the uh, didn't have the uh, film. Oh, the quick story did. behind that too. Apparently, when they did that, Eddie, uh, not Eddie, Jesus, uh, Martin and Will gaslit the kid and acted like they were beefing in real life. Oh no. So he was really scared. Yeah. That's so mean. Uh, Why would he do that? Oh, I would be so mad. Oh. Okay, so the film, I guess, is called Superfly. But there's a 70s version and then the 2018 one. Oh, crap. I actually... Yeah, the 2018 when I actually didn't too much uh, hate that movie. Yeah, the yeah, Superfly with um, Trevor Jackson. Tra- Trevor Jackson, there it is. Lex Scott Davis, how you doing? So hey. th- th- when we're talking about like guys named Nathaniel who's a gangster, it's either that or like Al Pacino in, in Scarface, right? Like very fancy looking dudes. But then you look closely and you realize their white suit has a little speckle of red on it. You're not going to ask why that's there. <laughs> that that That's hilarious. Now that you've referenced Superfly, I'm like, as broad as that scene when you first brought up the the title of these movies, I'm like, no, that's actually a perfect description <laughs> for that movie. But you're talking about like a white speck on, the, on a, a speck on a white uniform. Do you know the villains in that movie, Superfly, were called the Snow Patrol? Oh. It's because they wore all white all the time. <laughs> That's actually pretty dope. Do they have masks, too? I feel like they needed to have, like, <laughs> hockey masks or, like, white-painted, uh-huh. like, Halloween masks or something like that. Uh-huh. I feel like it's a missed opportunity. <laughs> I've, never, I've never seen the movie, and I have no idea what it's about. Okay, so he's getting out of the cocaine business, as one does. Yeah. I don't know how he ended up getting on Scott Hall. All right, let's move on to the Briscoes. Apparently, AEW is not interested in the Briscoes. Probably the biggest holdover names left of the Ring of Honor era or the Sinclair era of Ring of Honor. Um Everyone else has kind of landed. Not everyone, everyone, but the biggest of the big. Uh, there are other names like Bandito and Roosh, but they're, I think, AAA or CMLL. I think they're AAA town. So technically, they're on a bit of an excursion, if you will. With that said, apparently there are people in the uh, back of the AEW offices who do not like the Briscoes. And to be fair, I get it. Jay's a bit of a homophobe. They carry the Confederate flag pretty proud. Uh, they're they're very. What's the word I'm looking for? <sighs> polarizing. They're very polarizing. Marcus, are you surprised that the Briscoes don't have a uh, good reputation with AEW already? No, and when you talk about being homophobic, carrying around a Confederate flag, I'm like, 
I'd bring them in on a one day deal and have them thinking they finna go up against somebody like the Bucks or the Rastic Express or or freaking uh, FTR and put them in a match against Sonny Kiss and the partner of his shoes. Sonny Kiss and Nyla Rose. Ah, boom. Perfect. <laughs> reach, reach for that sky, boy. <laughs> Uh, the scary thing is, I think they may end up in Impact, and like, I don't like the Good Brothers. I don't. But uh, at that point, I'm like, hey, you know, I'll take the Good Brothers. <laughs> we were too harsh on you, dear ones. <laughs> you know, on second thought, maybe your you know alcohol fueled nonsense isn't so bad, considering neither of you are overtly racist. So yeah, you know, uh, that's cool. The only good thing Jay Briscoe's ever done was be Jay Lethal's, you know, pig for Welcome. slaughter during that promo. Yeah. That belt made you. I made this belt. Uh, I love that. Joel, well, we may have to do like best non mainstream pro wrestling promos one day. Cause that, that'll be that'll be on there. That'll be on there. Marcus, is there any place you want to see the Briscoes go, considering that they pretty much have very few uh, options besides maybe G C W. That's where they need to go. <laughs> so you never have to watch them? That too. It's a, it's a plus. But I also think that that caters, I mean, because, you know, them ain't really too good. I mean, they come in there looking at these ain't too um, Zach Rodders you got me. Sorry. Matt Cardona's you got coming up in there. Sorry. Did, uh, that's not his name. Didn't you mean Mid Cardona? Ah, yeah. It's ah. one of the best wrestling monikers of all time. Um, that actually fits, but it's, um, it's very, it's very honest. Mark and Jay look like two guys that would be the guys that will cross the line coming out of the GCW audience. So ultimately, to me, they'd be a perfect fit. Impact, nah. I mean, if you want to bring them in for a one-off against the, the, the like you know Motor City, but I don't need to see it. We don't need to see it. Like we. <laughs> We've had enough riffraff, if you will, and it's not taking away from Natana. We know what they can do. Um, but like I said, to me, they were going to retire in all age. Mm-hmm. And now that that's not a thing, I don't know. And I would imagine that they, they've set themselves up well. I mean, they don't seem like the most uh, overly extravagant guys. I mean, you know, Mark won't even get his teeth fixed. So, um you know, opulence ain't exactly a, a narrative for those two. So, yeah, I think GCW would be the perfect fit for those guys, just just for the style and the aesthetic and the vibe of it all. They could, you know, be hyper violent and this, that, and the third. So, you know. So they are going to be making an appearance with Impact on the April first WrestleCon events. It's called the uh, Multiverse of Matches, and the Briscoes are listed as fa- as being from Ring of Honor. And they're taking on the Good Brothers of Impact. Um, Eddie Edwards is taking on somebody on that event too, but he's representing Noah for some reason. Let, let me see if I can find this show. <laughs> taking the heel thing real serious. Like, I told y'all don't mess with Impact. <laughs> he, he noped so hard out of Impact, he went back to Japan. So we have... Eddie representing Noah taking on Tomohiro Ishii or Ishii ta- from New Japan. Uh, oh, Bullet Club versus that. Impact will be Jay White versus Chris Sabin. Uh, Deanna Parazzo will defend her Ring of Honor world title or AAA Arena to Reina's title. And then there's an ultimate X match. <clears throat> Apparently, Impact will then present a midnight show featuring the throwback style IPWF at the events as well. So there's going to be two shows back to back. So I like a good show. I don't. I don't need to. I don't need to see the Good Brothers face off with the Briscoes. Um, although I'm pretty sure they could. They turned out a good match. They want. I just don't have no interest in it. But everything else sounds pretty good on that. Uh, on that show. I agree. Um, I think it looks like a good card I, uh, so far. I would, I would kind of like to know Deanna's quote unquote opponent because the last time it was a mystery. I was disappointed in the reveal. Wasn't it Chelsea? That's why I was disappointed <laughs> in the reveal. <laughs> All right, it's not 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 a great reveal. That's for, that's for dang sure. 
Uh, speaking of great reveals, Paige Van Zandt's all elite. That's it. That's the headline. <laughs> yeah. And he, she uh, she signed her contract on Ty Conti's ass. So, I don't mind that at all. <laughs> yeah. So, so she, she, you know, in that scenario, Conti's, you know, top tier. <laughs> yeah. R- real top tier. You know, good good on them. Um, Paige is a very mercurial individual when it comes to combat sports. She was in beer, nu- beer, bare knuckle boxing for a few fights. Did not do well. Lost both bouts. Um, she kind of stepped away from MMA. She was good enough to get noticed and started to become a star in the UFC alongside Sage Northcutt. But they were both very young but very attractive. They both ended up leaving because they didn't like what they were being offered, and Sage ended up going to one championship in what was it, Singapore, and he got his face broken by a guy named Cosmo Alexander, and he's yet to return to fight. And I mean, like, his face broke. Oh, jeez. Yeah, it's, it's bad. <clears throat> uh, and then Paige left, signed with Bare, Bare Knuckle, and now, you know, after that, she was kind of looking at what to do next, and apparently uh, pro wrestling it is. Which makes sense. She's been talking about getting into pro wrestling for a while, and I, I, I actually support the move because there's a lot of name value in some of these fighters, especially Paige. And if you've ever seen Paige's Instagram, you know she's got a lot of assets. She can bring a lot to the table. And I appreciate that about her. So, you know, she's going to be interesting. I, I think she's a great addition and uh, she even has the trash talking down because when Teo was staring at her during the Sammy Guevara Scorpio Sky match, she said something like, you know, um, don't forget to take your boyfriend home with you tonight or something like that after he loses. And I'm just like, oh, oh, Paige. And like her husband is next to her while she's saying it. And Austin Vanderford looks like a pro wrestler himself. So I'm like, this, this could be interesting. I, I'm, I'm interested to see where this goes. Marcus, are you on board the Paige Van Zant bandwagon? Audio cut out. What was that? Are you on the Paige Van Zant bandwagon? Yeah, I mean, look, I think I think this is the perfect scenario because it encompasses everything that she is. Mm-hmm. Beauty, um, and brutality. You know, a, a lot of respect for her because not a lot of people would have chosen to do bare knuckle boxing. You know, regular boxing is hard enough, and and certainly uh, mixed martial arts. So, you know, for you know, I think this is, you know. I would imagine it'd be a natural progression. You know, she promos, the looks, the just everything. I think she could really show and prove here. She put in the right scenarios with the right opponents and you know, we already know what some of her style gonna be. So it's gonna be interesting to see what she can uh she gonna do. But she's definitely gonna be somebody I think to watch. because uh, even despite her size, she's a problem. So um yeah, it's gonna definitely be interesting to see what she uh does with her. That was a hell of a signing that she did, so You still there? Oh, yep. Yeah, sorry, I was muted myself for some reason. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, her signing the contract on Ty's ass, or Tay's ass was just... That's how you make a statement, folks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's how you make a statement. All right, speaking of making statements, we, we, we got to talk about Conti and her boyfriend, Sammy Guevara. Now, this is one of those situations where I need to preface this by saying... Fans are are overreacting, <clears throat> but then again, they're always going to do that. Social media is is a safe haven for the most malicious, sick, disturbed, and unhinged individuals. It gives them a place where they can you know get their most volatile and fervent opinions off their chest and into the ether. It's not a good place. <clears throat> I only use it to, to communicate with a few friends, post a few little gifts here and there, and, and work. I don't like social media. Although it's brought me a few friends in my life, so I can't say it's always been bad. But there's kind of an inherent acknowledgement. Like, if you are someone on social media who has a following, and you get that following by posting your public life, 
it does not matter, <clears throat> in my opinion, if those people are wrongheaded and pig-minded coming after you and accusing you of things that maybe you didn't do. To not expect it is completely and wholly your fault. If I jump into a lion's pit and I put my hand in, the, in his mouth and, no, and he doesn't bite me and I keep doing it and then finally he bites me, it's not the lion's fault. I knew he should have like, he should have bit me. That's what lions do. They bite. You leave a dog in a house all day, they're going to shit on the floor. Not their fault. It's what they do. That's why you got to let them outside. Take them for a walk. So for Tay Conti and Sam McVar to be so unhinged at, at, the, at the prospect of people accusing them of cheating on their significant others, because Conti was married and Sammy was engaged. Although Conti's marriage apparently ended before 2021, I think. <clears throat> I could be wrong about the date. And Sam McGuire was just recently engaged. Like, I think he got engaged at the end of 2021. So they're accusing them of, of hooking up while Sammy was still engaged. And listen, the timeline fits. Like, like there's a realistic possibility. And if, and if they didn't, it was w- like close enough where you could assume it was at least an emotional affair. Like, like you could... If that's your thing, if, if figuring out if these three people are involved in some triad, there's proof or at least enough there to make you at least suspect. Now, maybe you shouldn't. Like, who, 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 who's to say, right? These are grown people. They're saying that, you know, everything was, was kosher with the fiancé and she's not mad at Tay or, 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 or mad at Sammy at all, but she's not saying it herself. It's all coming from secondhand sources, so, like, who knows? <clears throat> but... Even though it's not right to harass people on a daily basis, you cannot, you know, negotiate with people who are going to say things to you in that regard regardless. Like, it's like you don't negotiate with terrorists. You don't negotiate with people who are going to do it regardless. There's no point to it. You know they're going to do it whether or not you approve of it or not. So I'm more on the bandwagon of this is what happens when you publicize every moment of your life and to act offended or to to disparage people for caring about you when you've made them care is the most narcissistic thing I've seen in, in the modern era. Not specifically just them, I mean in general. If you live your life in front of a camera 24-7 like they do, intentionally, I'm not talking about pro wrestling because like John Moxley has no social media presence. He's a character on TV, and then he goes home. He doesn't post on social media. He doesn't care. So if people were talking about his personal life, that'd be a bigger issue because he's not putting his personal stuff out there. He's not trying to draw attention. He's trying to be a character and then go home and be a father and a husband. Completely different worlds. <clears throat> With these two, they have blogs. At least Sammy does. He has video blogs, and, and like he, he shows everyone in the world, like, hey, this is who I am, this is what I'm about. He, didn't he propose to his girlfriend on AEW Dynamite or like at one of the shows, at least, off air? Uh-huh. Like, you can't sit here and say, well, stop paying attention to me while you're demanding they pay attention to you. You don't get to demand the type of feelings they have to your actions. You publicize your engagement. You publicize your breakup. You then publicize the fact that you were with Tay Conti, not romantically, but physically, not sexually, but in a similar space, for months during and after the breakup, <clears throat> or prior and during and after the breakup. So for fans to be like, well, did you cheat on her? That's a fair question. You've been putting all your stuff out there. You don't get to determine what they have questions about. If somebody came to me like, who are you dating? Don't fucking matter who I'm dating, because I've never said I'm dating anyone. I keep my private life private. I, I, I add little anecdotes like, hey, we watch Stand and Deliver a lot in school. That ain't that personal. <laughs> I'll tell anyone that because it's a great movie. But I'm not telling you about why, you know, I, I broke up with my last, last girlfriend or like why, you know, our relationships fell apart or like why someone did something to me at some. No, because none of that is you don't get to know that. I'm not living my life in front of the screen. I'm living one behind it because I work too goddamn much for that different story entirely. So when you see these people getting mad about the fan outrage, it's like, all right, if it's in a case like with like John Moxley, I get that. I do. 
But when you are always on social media promoting your private life as profit to try to make money, I have no sympathy for you. If you want your private life to be private, then stop being on social media 24-7. Like, you, these people are addicted to the, to the acknowledgement that they exist. And it's just like, man, my dream is to run a, a blog site that has two people read it every day. And I make a fair wage. Like, that's my goal. I don't want to deal with people. I don't like dealing with people. But I got to make money somehow. But I don't put my personal stuff out there to be judged. These people do. And then they're shocked when they're judged. Like, oh, my God. Because it turns out, Marcus, when you're like, hey, you know, we're getting in shape. Or we just landed a new job. Or, you know, we're having a babe or whatever. People are going to be like, oh, my God, congratulations. That's judgment. They're passing judgment. They're passing favorable judgment. They are deeming that your news is good. So don't be surprised when they pass negative judgment. You cannot live and die by the sword and then be surprised that you're living and dying by the sword. It's either one or the other. You cannot be like, yeah, I'm just going to slaughter a bunch of people with the sword, but don't get mad at me. I'm not, I don't want to have any repercussions. And I hate this, Marcus, because it's a juvenile mindset. But what should I expect from Sammy Guevara, the guy who wants to rape Sasha Banks? What should I expect? Should I be shocked? Because I'm, I'm not. <laughs> these, these people don't seem like good people. <laughs> Again, you know, we go back and, we, you know, we, we, we know the familiar with a lot of this behavior because of the, the uh, comic book uh, geeks uh, of it all. Um, a lot of people just unnecessarily over-invested in a lot of stuff they shouldn't be that invested in in the first place. Mm-hmm. Uh, to the point where they 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 have this uh this false sense of reality around this stuff. Like, why are you even mad about the you know Sammy? Stuff happens all the time. You know, people break up all the time. Engagements get put on, then they get put off. Um, it's always weird to me. I'm just, it's just a, it's just a a thing. I wouldn't I wouldn't propose in uh, public in front of people. That's just me. Um. Also, wouldn't be the person that goes around bragging about being engaged a bunch of times but never married. Just seems kind of weird to me. But Was yeah, these fans, Nikki Bella? man. They, they... No, God, I hope you didn't. Oh well, I mean, the scene is enough. So, uh, uh, yeah. But no, that, that that's just not a thing for me. But like you said, a lot of these people put themselves in these positions, and then they can't necessarily get mad at people's reactions and whatnot, which is why I think. And it's, you know, not defending it. They're just going kind of balls to the wall, no pun intended. Content Gabar, and they're they playing into it. You know, basically now throwing their relationship in people's face. And obviously they're happy, and it's in the third, and they probably had an extended honeymoon phase or whatever. But, uh, yeah, it's just, like you said, that they can do what they want to do. They're, they're perfectly, you know, sane adults. Um, but these fans, man, they... They they overly invested and entitled, mm-hmm. and it and it's sad. But this isn't the, these aren't the only people, and these aren't the only instances where that's that's true. You just wish you see less of it. But like you said, the the very platform breeds the narrative for it. So yeah, there there's there's a fun internet phrase that always applies: the "Don't feed the trolls." And I yeah. feel like people who live on social media like. Sammy Guevara and company does, they need to stop being shocked that these trolls are emboldened by them because they keep feeding them. And, and it's like, you have to understand, like, th- there's the world you wish you lived in and the world you live in. Yeah. You cannot keep living your life going, well, we need to change how this is. It's not going to happen, at least not overnight. So instead of sitting there and complaining about it 24-7... Adapt. If you know people are giving you shit because you're constantly posting about your private life on social media, stop posting your private life on social media. And it's not like these two dudes, or dudettes in this case, are like living and dying on their social media in terms of you know, th- their financials. Like, th- like There are people who only post on Twitter and Instagram and YouTube, and that's literally how they make money. These have these two have guaranteed contracts. They're making money. They they cannot be on social media and be fine. 
So it's kind of one of those things like if you engage in this type of behavior, if you open up an OnlyFans, if you, if you start releasing some extremely risque videos and people don't like it, that's not on them. That's on you. You need to realize that not everyone's going to be for you. And, and, and when you can accept that, you can start living a much healthier existence. But as long as you continue to chase after clout and clicks and, and simps and what have you, there are going to be people who, who come after you. Right or wrong, that's how it is. And, and, it, and it's either adapt and survive or, you know, fall apart and, you know. So, you know, to Sammy and, and Ty, Tay, whatever, you know, stop posting on social media if you don't like the people's uh, reactions. And, and, and truthfully, I granted, I, again, I acknowledge that the, the real tearing down, wagging the finger should be at the fans that are harassing them, but also... I don't think these people are, are all that well mentally to begin with, so like yelling at them is, is not going to be effective. Like if they're a fourteen year old, that's one thing. Most of the people yelling at them are not. So they've been on social media long enough. They know how they should or shouldn't behave and they're choosing to behave poorly. Unfortunately, Tay and, and Sam are gonna have to deal with that and either stop posting all your romantic love life on there like it's a, a soap opera, or accept that, you know, it's gonna happen more often. So that's all I got. So, Mark, is any other thing else from the world of pro wrestling that we want to touch on before we call it night? No, man, that's, that's pretty much it. Like I said, it's going to be a, a sullen week in, uh, for wrestling fans and just the industry in general, obviously, what we talked about earlier. But uh, oh, that's about it. I mean, it's still, you know, quality shows different products out there to watch and also if we're going into mania season a lot of other stuff is going on like you said you just talked about the multiverse of matches which is, i i'm glad they took that the spin on that concept and named it that shout out to whoever i did that was that was good but um and i'm i'm sure you know there's a lot of good mlw stuff coming up yeah um, they just had davy and hammerstone in the main event of the last show it was really good yeah yeah. So, uh, yeah, and then shout out to that that Cobra Kai that uh, that he rocked. Yeah. Inspired gear. It's cool. So with the wolf on the back, that, that's pretty dope. By the by, uh, Richard Holiday, uh, Hammerstone's former partner in the Dynasty, wore an all white suit and bloodied up Hammerstone, and I think that's where I uh, where I was thinking about the uh, the the white suit with the little splatter on. It. I think that's <laughs> I think I was subconsciously remembering MLW. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. But yeah, a lot of good wrestling. Not all, not all the, the quality uh, wrestling that's that's a narrative, narratively driven on on social media or whatnot. It's, it's coming on TV, man. You got MLW, as that impacts on fire doing that thing. Um, I don't necessarily know where to watch, wow, or it, what's going on there, but there's some good stuff there. And uh, CWC, the uh, website. Okay. Oh, nice. Okay, they're on Seed. All right. Go go CWC, check that out. They got good stuff on Seed anyway, so go check them out. And, uh, yeah, you know, tell you to always say to watch more wrestling and just, you know, find some alternative spots where it's at because it's not, trust me, all the good wrestling stuff is not on TV. Um, Is WoW back yet? No, I, I, I don't know exactly, but I, I've always kind of wondered, like, a specific spot to consistently get it. That's why I haven't. Checked it out the way I want mm-hmm. to, but not it's on seed. Um, I can't. I just know that. I mean, obviously we know Lee's involved and uh, Tessa, who you know has the stuff, but you know she's a phenomenal talent. So, um, like I said, CWC is a, is a good place to put it. Yeah, the whole first season's on there, so if you're interested. Uh, and the New Japan Cup's been a lot of fun too. Nice. So. I don't know when the next show is. I think it might be tonight or tomorrow. I think they said Wednesday, so probably tomorrow. So with that being said, uh, we're done. We're off. Uh, thanks for uh, checking us out. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for giving us a chance. Uh, remember, as always, to watch more wrestling. For Marcus, you can find him on his socials at Paradox Kid on Twitter, P-A-R-A-D-O-X-K-I-D. Yes, me. I'm always checking out his stuff. He always has some good stuff. You can also find him on his other podcast, The True Brandy Show, T-R-U-E-P-E-N-N-Y-S-H-O-W, over on Twitter as well. Uh, 
So check them out when the, for their next show. You can find me on Twitter at Chad Nerdcorp, C H E D N E R D C O R P, and on Instagram at Chad's photo at C H E D S P H O T O H U T. For Mark Train, I'm Chad Porto. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for checking us out. Thanks for giving us a chance. Watch more wrestling. And as always, Marcus, take us home. Good night, mate.